Okay, so I think what I'll do now is say welcome to everyone. I'm Carol, one of the PLO team, and I'm going to hand over to Simon, and uh, he will start the webinar um, with his uh, introduction. Um, thank you very much, um, Carol, and welcome everybody to this uh, 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 webinar. It'll be a 30 minute webinar and uh, talking about how our Sentinel surveillance network monitors um, contagious disease and background levels of immunity in the population. If I may, we'll move on to the next slide. Um, this is an overview of the program. I'm going to give a very uh, brief introduction about the vital contribution of the sampling that's taking extra blood tests for serology and viral swabs to sentinel surveillance. Um, my colleague from UKHSA, uh, Dr. Gayatri Amathingan, um, who's an epidemiologist and leads on um, serology in, within UKHSA, will talk about how the specimens we collect in primary care are used to monitor disease. And the most, well, the biggest challenge is always how you integrate doing these very useful things into clinical workflow. And Dr. James Kennard, as GP and research lead at Banbury Cross Health Centre, is then going to talk about the model that they've used to integrate this work into, uh, in, into primary care workflow. And then we've got um, a short um, session from uh, Jess Smiley, uh, who supports Carol, in uh, running our practice liaison team. I have the next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so just running up on the screen here is about the uh, English uh, primary care surveillance system. We now try and use the word ORCID for the overall data hub and the trusted research environment that we have. And then within ORCID sits the surveillance program, which is the uh, RSC, the Research and Surveillance Center. I'll move on to the next slide. Um, we've grown immensely. Um, as you probably know, they, the college celebrates an important birthday next year, but we in the um, Research and Surveillance System also do. And this is uh, by April, we'll have completed our 55th year of Sentinel surveillance. So we're one of Europe's oldest um, sentinel system. Uh, we consider ourselves a bottom-up, professionally-led network, and member practices, including my own practice, share data with the network for what we describe as square purposes for surveillance, the, the key thing we do for quality improvement, research, and education, and there are opportunities for practices to take part in research projects. And we're very keen to maximize the use of uh, data in, in computerized medical records. And we talk a lot about how um, coding is caring that if you want to have your medical records accurately reflect the care that we're giving, then coding is caring because you perhaps give someone a, a, a an anticoagulant, but if the reason that is prescribed isn't clear, it may be unclear when to stop it um, or what dose it, uh, it, it should be adjusted to. So high quality data has long term been a really good underpinning of our network and of the, um, uh, of, um, the quality of primary care. Can we move on a slide? Um, this is just really a bit of a graphic to show the extent of our work. Each of those little uh, uh, little graphs has the weeks of the year across the bottom and the number of samples across the top. And here you can see three years data and uh, influenza-like illness, one of the key conditions we monitor, lower respiratory infections and COVID, which you can see peaking away in the uh, last graph on the right are just three of the conditions that we monitor. But where the place we really add value as a network is the last two columns, which are virology specimens. Historically, we just collected those through the winter season, 
but for the moment we're collecting all the year round. And as you can see from a very flat line on the bottom left graph, we didn't used to collect serology, but now we've had a really active couple of years in serology samples and want to do more. To give an idea of the scale, in the year to September 2021, we as a network collected over 8,000 pairs of virology swabs and nearly 25,000 serology samples. And we and our colleagues in UKHSA are keen for us to collect um, e e e even more. Um, and the focus today is on serology samples. And this is about when people attend for routine blood tests, uh, asking, do they mind giving an extra uh, bottle of blood that will be analyzed for um, antibodies against uh, infections that might be circulating at the time. Uh, it only requires verbal consent. There are no results that come back to the practice from this work because they really have to be analyzed on a uh, sort of population basis. Uh, can we hop on to the next slide, please? So this is just an example now of how our data is used. And this sort of really will take you in a bit to the um, Gayatri's um, short presentation that's coming, uh, uh, coming next. So this is a, an example of a paper um, uh, where 8,000 of our serology specimens collected from volunteer patients were used to look at uh, immunity in, in risk groups. And the research was able to pick out um, the risk groups who perhaps are responding less well uh, to um, vaccines. You just press um, uh, again, please, Carol. And, and I don't want to get too into this graph, but this graph has two rows, one for AstraZeneca and one for Pfizer-BioNTech. And after the first dose and the second dose, you get a, an impression across multiple samples. And as you, a dot is higher up the page, so you have a, um, uh, a, um, a, a sort of greater level of immunity. But the point I really wanted to make is each one of those dots is an extra blood bottle collected on a particular day in different people uh, in our practices. And this helps provide some extraordinary insight. And the higher up the page, if you like, the greater the immunity. So you can see after dose one, there was some immunity. And then after dose two, nearly all the dots are towards the top of the, of, of the graph and maybe waning just a tiny, tiny bit as you look from uh, left to right. And our sampling enables studies like this to be done. And, and, um, and um, Gaj is going to talk a little more about this in a moment. You can just press, um, press again. And, and this is just again after the first dose of vaccine showing this is, uh, this, this um, uh, graph is um, uh, based on the quality of the data we record uh, rather than on the serology samples. But it shows for the different ages for AstraZeneca that's in black and the Pfizer BioNTech, which is in blue, the uh, different vaccine effectiveness. And the more, uh, if you like, the, these, these um, um, marks on the graph are to the right, then the higher the vaccine effectiveness and the more to the left, the, the lower. So we're able to link from data across the network what background immunity is like and what overall vaccine effectiveness is like. And, and I hope everyone on the call and people considering joining the network are, are, are proud of the, the fantastic uh, contribution we make. So I'll pass over to, to Gayatri if that's okay. Thanks very much, Simon. And um, th thanks very much for the invitation to speak to you all today. Um, it's really great to be um, able to sort of highlight and um, showcase the sort of valuable work and samples that are being provided through the network and how in UKHSA uh, we're really using this information um, on an ongoing basis really to inform um, the vaccine programme and vaccine policy. Um, so if we can move to the next slide. 
So this is just a pyramid of the um, sort of routine surveillance that we undertake at UKHSA for COVID-19 and really just showing the sort of breadth of work that we're looking at and the sort of different data sources that we use to really understand the burden of disease within the population. Um, and really what I wanted to highlight is that um, sitting at that bottom of that pyramid is looking at um, what we call seroprevalence, really understanding the level of exposure and infection within the population and how much transmission has actually occurred um, within the population. And why is seroprevalence so important? Well, what it, why it's important is really because we know that a large proportion of infections are um, will not have any symptoms, will be asymptomatic. And so to really understand the extent of transmission, both symptomatic and asymptomatic within the population, we really rely on seroprevalence prevalence surveys to really get a good assessment of how much spread there is. Um, next slide please Carol. One of the other things that we really need to understand is sort of the timelines from um, an individual developing symptoms to actually presenting in each of those different data sets, whether it be in terms of the number of cases through symptomatic surveillance, um, whether they um, are um, requiring hospitalization. And what you can see on this um, timeline is that it actually takes at least two weeks for an, an antibody response following infection to occur. And therefore, it's important when you're interpreting or looking at our seroprevalence data to take that into account. The, by definition, there will be already a lag of at least a couple of weeks. So any data that's being presented is really reflecting the situation of transmission or the patterns of infection that are occurring at least two to three weeks prior to what um, you're actually seeing. Uh, next slide, please. So we've actually adapted the um, approach in terms of serological testing um, over the course of the pandemic, and particularly with the introduction of the routine vaccine program, we've had to develop that um, and adapt that further. So at UKHSA, we actually have two different types of assays, which all samples that you're providing us are tested on. Um, and they're targeting different parts of the virus itself or the antibody response. The first is what we call a nuclear protein or N-based assay. And this is really used to detect um, evidence of infection. Um, antibodies to N um, or nuclear protein tend to pick up very early in the course of the infection, and they are um, a very good marker of exposure to um, coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2. In addition to looking at the N-based assay, we also do um, antibodies or serological tests to what we call the spike-based assay or an S um, S response. This tends to pick up later in the course of an infection, but importantly, um, the vaccines we're using in our UK program are based on that spike protein and therefore using S um, uh, testing as well, we're able to um, distinguish between responses to vaccine and responses to natural infection. So essentially, since the course of the introduction of an implementation of the vaccine program across the UK, all our samples that are collected through this program are tested both on the Roche N and Roche S assays to be able to help us determine how much of the responses we're seeing is relating to infection or natural exposure and how much of the antibody responses we're seeing within the sampling is due to vaccine. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we have a number of collections that are run um, in UK HSA for, to support the ser serological and seroprevalence surveillance. And um, I, I think I want to really emphasize that the RCGP collection um, is particularly unique and valuable. And that's for a number of reasons. I mean, as um, Simon's already um, alluded to, and obviously many of you who are on the call today know, these are collected opportunistically from patients um, attending for routine blood tests. And um, therefore the sort of demographics of the samples that we're collecting tend to be older um, in more clinically vulnerable patients and that's really important because we tend to lack some of those sets of samples in our other collections. The other thing that's the most relevant and unique um, is, as um, Simon has alluded to, is the fact that we're able to link back to the GP records. And this means that we can get very detailed granular information on those samples that we've collected, including vaccination records, um, clinical um, um, information, and as well as demographic information. And I'll show you how we're using that um, in, in the next slides. So if we move on. 
So Simon sort of showed you this, but I've sort of added on some additional data um, to what has already been presented. So one of the key sets of um, and uses of the data and the serology samples that are being collected through the network is actually looking and following up antibody responses following vaccination. And you can see the two graphs as we've already shown, um, the top graph showing responses to the AstraZeneca vaccine. And then if you look at the bottom graph, that's showing responses to Pfizer. And you can see dose one responses, dose two and dose through as you move along the timeline. Um, as you'll notice, you've got yellow or orangey colored dots and blue colored dots, and that's to distinguish those who are N positive, the orange ones, which are essentially individuals who've had prior infection. And then the blue colored dots are the N negative, those who are actually naive. So what you can generally see is much higher levels of antibody responses in those with prior infections shown by the orange dots. And what you do see is that improved response overall, regardless of which vaccine, when they've had their completed their primary course. And then the additional benefit of having that dose three, the booster responses um, over time. And I think what's really important, as you can see, is that we are continuing to encourage to collect samples following the booster, because for us, it's going to be really critical over time to see how those antibody levels persist after that third dose has been received. Um, next slide, please. So as I said, in addition to looking at overall antibody responses, what's really been valuable and important to feedback in terms of the program evaluation is how individuals in particular risk groups respond to vaccine and are there particular groups who may not respond as well um, or are as well protected uh, compared to others. Um, if we move to the next slide, um, we can see by linking the data from the samples that you're providing us with their GP records, we've been able to look at antibody responses by risk group. And this just highlights, it's a very busy slide, but essentially what I wanted to highlight is the fact that we do see differences after the second um, dose um, between different risk groups, particularly so for the immunosuppressed. Um, as you will see, um, there were significantly lower antibody responses in immunosuppressed compared to healthy individuals um, after completion of the primary course and this data was specifically fed back to the UK's JCBI committee the vaccine committee and it was really um, informative and useful for them to make decisions around um, giving additional doses to the immunosuppressed individuals so it's really important to recognize that this information is directly feeding into policy um, next slide please um, so this really looks at that immunosuppressed group in more detail and really highlights the fact that even after your primary course, uh, regardless of whether you've received the AstraZeneca or the Pfizer vaccine, actually antibody levels are not as um, high as what we would expect to see in the immunocompetent. So the immunosuppressed groups are shown in those orange lines, and you can see that generally those dots are lower than the healthy groups, which are shown in the, in the gray lines. And so what's really critical now going forward is to see how those immunosuppressed individuals are responding after they've received their third dose. So it's a, again a plea to continue to provide us with samples because we are directly looking at this specific question to understand how these individuals are responding to vaccine going forward. Uh, next slide please. So I hope this gives you some sort of flavor in terms of how we use um, the serology samples that are being provided through the network. I think it's really important that the um, samples generally and are being used to evaluate seroprevalence more broadly across the population. And it's very critical to understand this, to um, assess the extent of transmission within the population. Um, as I've shown, we're looking at two different assays for all the samples that you're providing to help us distinguish between natural infection, natural exposure and vaccine impact. And I think, as, as, as I hope it's shown, the collections that whilst we have a range at UKHSA, the RCGP collection particularly is unique because of its ability to link to a detailed clinical and demographic information. And so this particular set of data has been used to look at vaccine responses by clinical risk group, particularly the immunosuppressed. And the data that we have been generating from this um, information is being regularly fed back um, to SAGE as part of our UK seroprevalence reports, as well as particularly regularly reported back to JCVI to support decision making, particularly on the need for additional doses for immunosuppressed individuals. So I'd just like to end by sort of thanking you all for your continued participation and a, a plea to continue to provide us with these valuable samples because they are really being uh, feeding into policy decisions and really valuable for us to track the course of the pandemic. Um, so I think my final slide is sort of an acknowledgement slide, just to thank everyone involved and a particular thank you to all the participating practices. Thanks very much.
Okay, so let's move on. Thanks, James. And um, over to you for how you manage to make sampling work in, in your practice. Thanks, Carol, and thanks to you and to Simon for inviting me today. It's been really interesting to hear from Gayatri the context and the outcome of um, what we do. So thank you. So um, my name is James Kennard. I'm um, a GP and the research lead at Banbury Cross um, Health Centre in North Oxfordshire. Um, we're a large sort of just under 41,000 patient practice and um, we've, we're quite happy with the way we've fine-tuned doing the serology sampling now. Next slide please Carol. So um, the way we tend, we've we've done it now is with a series of steps. So um, every every day, our reception team are reviewing um, the upcoming blood test appointments that we've got booked into the system. I'm sure sort of lots of practices know that with electronic booking online, you end up with patients trying to book all sorts of things into a blood test appointment that shouldn't be there. Um, but this then also off offers an opportunity for our um, reception team to text message out to those patients where we've got a mobile number um, and they're coming in for a blood test in the next day or two um, some information and a link to the patient information leaflet about the serology surveillance work and so this then means that when the patient actually turns up at the practice to see um, the phlebotomist or one of our HCAs to have the sample taken they hopefully know about the study already and so doing the um, verbal consent is um, usually quite a quick process the sample just gets taken alongside their other samples. Next slide please Carol. Um, so this is the text message that we um, send out um, to the patients. Um, at the moment um, our reception team they've taken the decision that they're just going to manually send this to each patient that's coming in but you could also run a quick search of patients that are booked in the next 24-48 hours for a blood test and then do a batch text message out using um, one of the batch test text messaging um, services um, so there's lots of ways to do the same thing and as you can see there's a link in this to the um, patient information leaflet on the um, ORCID website um, preparing this slideshow yesterday made me actually go back and double check and yes I needed to update the link to the latest version of the leaflet so um, you do need to do that but what we found is doing this patients turn up to see the phlebotomist and they really want an extra sample taken so they turn up and say I got a text message about it please can you do it and um, please you know I'm happy to take part um, so we found that's actually saved time um, against where in the past the phlebotomist used to have the patient information leaflet and used to give it to the patient to read while they prepared the labels and things like that. Um, we found that this is time saving and also ends up with a much higher uptake. So um, the little bit of time investment from the reception team who are checking the um, checking um, the appointments anyway definitely pays dividends in, in uptake. Um, next slide, please, Carol. Um, so in terms of then for the phlebotomy team for our HCAs, in order to make sure the process runs smoothly, um, we make sure that all of the HCA rooms have the serology kits stocked in them. We make sure that they have got paper copies still of the PIL, just in case patients want to have another look. We're very lucky in that our um, IT system means that um, every time basically a patient comes for blood samples spare, spare stickers get spat out of the printer which can then easily just be put onto the um, serology kit um, bottles and the paperwork in there which makes life very easy but I know sort of um, it's, it's fairly easy to choose to print extra labels in other systems you've got but that, that is an advantage we've got. Um, we do make sure that in all the HCA rooms there's a reminder about the importance of coding for the serology work and I'm going to come on to that again in a minute because in terms of um, matching up the samples um, you'll hopefully know that it's important that the, the, it is coded in the patient record so it can be matched up to the patient um, but we also um, we also actually you know set don't put excess pressure on the team. So we do sort of say to them, look, if they're if the HCAs are having a bad day, they're short staffed, they're having to cross cover for somebody that's sick. And it's the same goes for the reception team. You know, if they have a day or two where they can't do it, um, don't stress because actually we'd much rather that they felt that it was worthwhile part of their role and that it wasn't a stress making part of the role because then actually they just get on and do it most of the time. Um, so we do sort of say, don't stress. 
happen. Okay, next slide, please. So in terms of the coding, some of our HCAs are happy just man just manually adding the in the the the, the, the the sample serology code and 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 choosing it from the drop down list um, in EMIS. We're in EMIS practice, um, but we've also built this little shortcut. So those of you that use EMIS will know that you can add shortcuts to the F12 key, and so we've created a shortcut on the F12 that then just links to the serology work will automatically. It just pops up a box saying it's going to add the code, and then when they click OK, it adds the code into the patient's um, record, um, nice and elegantly. So again, there's many ways of doing this, but we found that for some of our HCAs, they just like how quick and easy this is um, to do. And it really didn't take long to set up. And I believe you could very easily set up similar things in system one and other IT systems as well. Next slide, please. So the final thing I was just going to say was a couple of top tips. Um, so our main phlebotomist um, on the HCA team monitors our serology kit levels, and we always try to make sure we've got a good number in stock um, so that we order early um, to keep our stock levels up. The, the occasion when we got this system running and we very quickly within a couple of days ran out of um, serology kits. Um, we had very upset patients turning up wanting to provide their sample and of course we couldn't take it. So um, we do make sure we've got the kits in the rooms and we do make sure we order them early. We also, it's that giving value to the work that the RHCA team are doing. We feed back to them quarterly now. So we tell them how many samples they've taken and we tell them the income that the practice then gets from the sampling work. And to an HCA, on an HCA salary, cumulatively that adds up and they can see how that equates to, um, well, basically equates to their salary um, or a good proportion of it um, for very little, you know, for what's very little work and, and, and doesn't take much effort for them. So there's value for that. And then again, regularly reminding them about the importance of coding um, so that it all gets matched up and, 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 and and can be logged it through the through the RSC system. So those are the top tips for what I do. So um, if anybody's got any questions, um, I'll happily take them. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, I, I think you've um, managed to absorb this into your uh, practice really quickly. Um, so it's been very successful. And it's good to know um, you've got some good systems there. Um, I think from our perspective, we, we try to um, meet the requirements for these um, supplies. So it just highlights to me that we should be <laughs> very uh, on that um, to make sure you get what you want because there's nothing worse than patients willing to give samples and, and you can't do it because our supply network isn't, isn't there. I think there's a, um, um, so Rebecca's just said really useful, James, thank you. <laughs> Okay, well, um, thanks, James, and um, I'm sure we, we may even um, have some questions later on, uh, which, you know, we, we can always um, ask you after the session um, has finished. Okay, let's move on, and um, I think it's more a case now of, Jess, you just letting um, the team, or the, or the um, people in the, on the uh, webinar know what's available from our perspective in terms of uh, training. Of course, if we can pop on, there we go. We've only got a short slide for you, so I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but it is just a quick chat to talk about what we in the PLO team can provide in terms of training. So we each cover a different region, but we can cross regions if needed, if someone's not available. So. We are here to support you in any way you need by virtual sessions. So we can set up Teams meetings, we can do phone calls. We can also carry out practice visits, which we find are very useful. It's a lot easier to go through this process when we can talk to you face to face, meet the team, talk to everyone and see what your requirements are. We can also provide webinars to train you much like these, but it will be more topic specific. Any session we carry out with any of you will be tailored to suit whatever your requirements are. It can be anything from, I can't get onto the website to do material requests. That's fine, we can talk you through it. We can even on occasion place those requests for you. Anything up to, I can't get my EMIS form to upload or 
covering any of the topics that James has talked about. They are all really useful ways of making this work in a practice. They won't all work for everyone. Every practice is different, but a lot of them can work for you. It's just finding the right way to implement them. We're not gonna leave you on your own. We are here to get you through this any way you need. Uh, if you are already in contact with any of us, continue to do so. If you're new, if you haven't spoken to any of us before, we've got the practice inquiries email address that you can contact us through and any one of us will come back to you. Just as an example of some of the queries that can come up, some of you might have been thinking this but not yet mentioned it. I visited a practice to talk through serology sampling, talk to the HCA, talk to the nurse that was there because they were very interested in how this process works. Simple questions such as, who can do this? Are there restrictions? Are there age limits? Do you want specific groups? Or something such as, you know, how do we get past explaining the rationale behind the serology sampling? Because we don't provide results to the patients. Now with some practices, they're happy to go ahead and provide the sample anyway. Some may be a bit apprehensive. So it's just about providing training, wording, anything that you can use to relay to the patient, to reassure them and to get the sample you need. Thanks, Jess. Um, well, we're just about out of time, but um, I'll um, say um, thank you very much for joining. Simon, is there anything else you wanted to add as a closer? Thanks very much to all of the presenters. I don't know whether Simon uh, heard that, but in case he's still on mute, I'll uh, say thanks for joining us and we'll be putting um, a link to this webinar on the site, which will come up in about um, 10 days time. But once again, thanks for joining. If you've got any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to contact uh, our email address at the end. But I think all of the contributors have shown, particularly uh, Gayatri from UKHSA, how important this work is. And we really do appreciate all the efforts that you make. So please keep on sampling. And uh, I'm sure you'll have learned a lot of hints and tips on how to uh, actually get this working in your practice. We're here to help, as Jess said. Simon, do we want to just uh, finish off? Well, I was just going to say thank you very, very much for all who attended and came along and do, do keep on with fantastic data quality and all this uh, sampling. It's really a, 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 a fantastic opportunity to uh, contribute to um, public health. <laughs>